Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. The signs were ready and waiting by the front door. I'd taken the better part of the last couple of days on them because I wanted them to be perfect. Now the hard part. Up the stairs, into the master bedroom, rip off the bedclothes, wrestle the mattress off the queen-size bed and half carry, half slide it down the stairs, down the hall, through the front door and out onto the front lawn next to the street. Back into the house, up the stairs, toss the slats and bedclothes down the stairs, follow them down and take them outside, tossing them into a pile beside the mattress. Another trip to the bedroom, kick apart the side rails and hustle them outside. Check my watch, for 22, have to hurry, need to be done by 5. The headboard and footboard followed, and by 4.35 the bed was back together. Next, the kitchen table. That was light enough that I was able to scoot and carry it, turning it sideways and angling it through the door, placing it next to the bed in the yard. The final item was the 6x8 throw rug in the living room. I rolled it up and placed it by the other items in the yard, erected the signs and noted with pride that it was only 4.55. 10 minutes to go till my wife comes home. I walked to the middle of the street and turned to view my handiwork. It looked so beautiful it almost brought a tear to my eye. My wife's and my marriage bed, the kitchen table and throw rug. The three places I knew for sure my wife and her lover had used repeatedly over the past six months. And the signs, so perfect, placed high enough to be out of reach and one by one I read them. The large sign in front of the furniture, these items are yours for the taking. Free. They are no longer wanted in this house. If you are able to stomach the stench of adultery and broken vows, help yourself. The sign above the bed read, On this bed my wife repeatedly broke her wedding vows and threw our marriage away by having sex with her lover twice a week for the past six months. This afternoon was their most recent tryst and the smell of their bodies still clings to the sheets. Over the kitchen table was the sign that said, My wife and her lover often had sex on this table, usually just a few hours before she served me dinner. Over the throw rug was a sign that said, My wife and her lover seemed to prefer this rug for their fun. To each sign I had stapled a 17 by 24 inch photo of the adulterous pair consummating their union on the appropriate piece of furniture. There was a fifth sign, fixed slightly behind the table which read, My wife's lover is her boss, Greg Allen of Mitchell, Price and Allen Realty. He's married and has three children. I don't think his wife knows about any of this, but she soon will. For 57, just in time, she would be home any minute. I turned and looked around me and found a group of neighbors already gathering to watch what I was doing. Several cars had stopped and more than one person was talking on a cell phone, either calling their friends to come take a look, or calling the police to have me arrested for fostering public indecency. I casually waved to the assembling group and walked into the house, closing the door after me. At precisely 5.05 p.m., I saw my wife's car turn the corner at the end of the block and immediately slow down, seeing all the people gathering near our house, looking at something on our lawn and talking and laughing among themselves. Slowly, she drove to the house we'd shared for the past 10 years and stopped in front, staring at the side of the furniture and the signs in our front yard, paying, I'm sure, special attention to the large photos of her and her boss, Greg Allen, having sex. Their faces masks of lust and pleasure. Even through her car window, and the window of my house, and with all the conversation of the forty or fifty people standing around gawking, I still heard her scream, No, oh God, no. Finally, her eyes moved from the signs to the front window of the house where she saw me standing. We stared at each other, she looked grief-stricken, her face an ashy white. I could see tears falling down her cheeks, she seemed to be asking me why. I had the same question for her. I watched her for a few seconds, then turned away from her closing the curtains behind me. I guess at this point I should explain how my wife Sherry and I arrived at this tragic place. My name is Jack Meyer. I met Sherry in college our junior year. A mutual friend suggested we get together, and when we met for the first time I was smitten. Sherry wasn't a beautiful woman in the classic sense, but she was so damn cute and sexy. Five foot two, with beautiful blue eyes and dishwater blonde hair down to her shoulders. Her body was petite, but perfectly proportioned and her tiny waist captivated me and though she didn't know it at the time, she had me and the thought that I wouldn't win her never crossed my mind. Sherry and I started dating and within a few weeks we were a couple. A month after we met, we made love for the first time and it was like nothing I had ever experienced. I was obsessed with Sherry and couldn't get enough of her body. Neither of us were virgins our first time, but we were far from experienced and we luxuriated in each other's bodies. 
Oral sex was wonderful and everything we tried seemed to become our favorite. I think it is safe to say we were as deeply in love as it was possible for two people to be. We were married just after graduation and moved into our first home, a condo in Van Nuys. Sherry got her real estate license and went to work with one of the area's more prominent agencies. I used my engineering degree to snag a nice position with an electronic manufacturing company and we settled into a life I thought was perfect. For the next 13 years, we shared a fabulous life together, first in our condo, then as our earnings increased, we bought our dream home and started our family. First came Shelby, now eight years old. Then two years later along came Ryan, who is now six. Sherry and I loved those two kids to total distraction. We lived for each other and our family. So what happened? I wish I could tell you. I wish I could say I picked up on the little signs that told me something was wrong, but I didn't. I was totally oblivious, living in a world of absolute love and trust with my wife. It took a fluke to fill me in on what was going on. A fluke caused by our daughter Shelby getting sick at school. It was a Thursday, and I got a call just before noon from the school nurse that Shelby had come down with what appeared to be the flu. At the time, I was in the middle of a staff meeting and asked the school nurse to please call my wife. The nurse told me she had tried calling Sherry at her office, where she was told my wife would be out for most of the rest of the day. She tried our house, but there wasn't an answer so she left a message, then her cell, only to be directed to her voicemail. So, she called me since it was important that my daughter be picked up as soon as possible. I made my apologies to my staff and drove as quickly as I could to Shelby School where I picked her up and headed for home. When we got there and I opened the garage door I was surprised to see a car I didn't recognize parked in my car spot next to my wife's. Instantly I got a lump in my throat and my stomach began to churn. No, it couldn't be, I told myself. My wife, the woman I loved more than life itself couldn't be having an affair, it wasn't possible. But still, why was there a strange car in the garage with the door down? Something was very wrong and I had to find out and I couldn't let my daughter find out with me. Stay in the car for a minute, Shelby. I told her. But why? I want to go to bed. She whined. I know it, baby, but I think the exterminator is here spraying the house for bugs and the spray will make you even sicker. I lied to her. The first lie I'd ever told my daughter. Let me check first and then I'll come and get you. Daddy, what's wrong? Nothing, Shelby. I'm fine. Just the stink in the house really bothered me. Got to me. I'm fine. Don't worry. I'm fine. I left Shelby with her grandmother, telling her I'd pick her up in a couple of hours. I didn't explain anything to my mom about what I had witnessed, just told her to watch Shelby till I got back from work. I was tempted to drive back to my house and confront the cheating pair, but decided I needed more than just a confrontation. I needed revenge, and as I drove back to my office I began to form the plans that would ruin my wife and her boss forever. The electronics firm I worked for had several divisions. I was a senior engineer in the medical equipment division, and we shared a large complex with another division that designed and built commercial security equipment. When I reached my office, I told my secretary to make sure I wasn't disturbed the rest of the afternoon, then picked up the phone and called my counterpart in the security division. Dan Taylor was an outstanding engineer and had been a good friend ever since college. I told him I needed to see him right away, and he said he was coming my way anyway to drop off some blueprints to be copied and he'd see me in half an hour. I told my secretary that Dan could come into my office as soon as he arrived and true to his word he knocked on my door 20 minutes after our phone conversation. What's cooking, Jack? Come in, Dan, and close the door. I told him. Whoa, you look like you just lost your last friend, he told me. I think I have, and I need your help. Anything, Jack. What's going on? I just caught my wife and her boss having sex at my house, in my bed. Damn, Jack. You're kidding. I wish I were. I had to pick up my daughter at school, and when I got home, there was a strange car in my garage. I snuck in and found them in our bedroom, on our bed. I couldn't believe it. But it's true. Shit, Jack. That shouldn't happen to anyone. What happened when you confronted them? I didn't confront them. I wanted to. But my daughter is sick, and I couldn't take a chance that she might see them, so I made her wait in the car for me. After I saw them together, I left quietly and took Shelby to my mom's house. What are you going to do? I'm not really sure, but I do know I need proof. I need audio and video of them the next time they do it, and that's where you come in. You need security cameras and mics? Something small. I can hide in several rooms in the house that will record everything that goes on. I think I can help you with that, Jack. But how do you know there will be a next time? Maybe this was a one-time thing where things got out of control. No chance, Dan. They talked about the fact they'd been doing it regularly for the last six months. 
I don't know if they always go to my house, but I'm willing to bet they do. Hotels leave paper trails that neither of them can afford and her boss's wife stays at home, so that leaves only my house available when I'm at work and the kids are in school. We talked a few more minutes, then we got down to business. Dan said he had access to a new beta line of wireless miniature cameras and microphones that would work with my laptop or home computer. He also had a small, voice-operated recorder that I could put under Sherry's car seat to capture any conversations she might have while she was driving. It would only capture her side of the conversation, but it was better than nothing. I thanked him and told him I'd pick up everything in his office the next day. Going home that night was the hardest thing I'd ever done. I had no idea if I could face my wife and act like nothing had happened. I figured the best thing I could do is make Sherry think I wasn't feeling well, which was the truth. I picked up Shelby from my mom's and when I got home Sherry was fixing dinner in the kitchen. When she saw I had Shelby with me she became frantic. Where have you been? And why didn't you call and tell me that Shelby was sick? I just got the school nurse's message on the answering machine. The school tried to call you Sherry, but for some reason you weren't available. They called your office and were told you weren't there. Then they tried the home phone and left the message. They even called your cell, but it went a voicemail. Oh God, I must have accidentally turned it off when I was showing houses. I didn't have a minute to myself all day. Yeah, I'm sure of that I thought. Too busy having sex with your boss to be bothered with your daughter. Sherry hugged Shelby and told her how sorry she was, then helped her to her bed. My wife may be a total witch, but she does love her kids. I was the one that appeared to be the impediment to her happiness. Well, that was going to change and very soon. Sherry got our daughter to bed and came back to the kitchen to fix soup for her and finish making dinner for the rest of us. I'm not feeling well either, I told her. I think I'll sleep in the guest room tonight, just in case I'm contagious. Sherry felt my forehead. You do feel a little clammy, honey, and you look pale. Yeah, I thought, pale and clammy. That's what happens when you catch your wife having sex with another man in your bed. I didn't answer her, just turned and climbed the stairs. I went first to the master suite. I hated to go in there, but I needed my shaving gear, toothbrush, and clothes for work the next day, so I forced myself to enter the room. A window was open and the smell of sex was gone and the bed was made. She must have changed the sheets. It killed me to look at it. All I saw in my mind was her boss having sex with her, while she told him how good it was and that she belonged to him and him alone forever. Anger rose inside of me like a wave, but I forced it down. I had to remain calm until I could bring the fires of hell down on both their heads and I would. That was a guarantee. I would. I gathered the items I needed and went to the guest bedroom, closing the door behind me. I stripped down to my skivvies and climbed into bed. My body felt wooden. I wanted to cry, but I forced it down. I had a mission to complete, and I couldn't allow emotions to get in the way. For hours I lay there in the dark, with sleep eluding me. My wife came into the room after she'd fed the kids and put them to bed. I feigned sleep. She touched my forehead with the palm of her hand and then left the room, closing the door behind her. Sherry always took the kids to school, so I got up early, showered and left the house before she got up. I'm sure that seemed strange to her, but I would just tell her that I needed to make up for the lost hours yesterday when I was feeling ill. Frankly, I didn't care what she thought at this point. I just wanted out. Out of what I thought, until yesterday, was a beautiful marriage built on lifelong loyalty, honesty, and commitment. How tragically wrong I was. I got to work before any of the office staff arrived, made a pot of coffee, and started laying out my plans. I knew I would need to cancel our joint credit cards, transfer half our joint checking and savings accounts into another bank under my name only. I would change my will, life insurance, and 401k beneficiaries removing Sherry and naming only Shelby and Ryan. It seemed so little to have to do to dissolve the last 13 years of my life. It should be harder and deep inside I figured at some point it would be. I also knew I needed to find a good divorce attorney to try to keep Sherry from raking me over the coals. This was a no-fault divorce state, so adultery wouldn't play into the financial settlement. It might, however, help me get to keep my kids. Sherry had proven how unimportant I am in her life, but she was a good mom, and I didn't want to keep her away from her children. I just wanted joint custody, so I would remain an important part of their lives too. I tried with all my might to not think about our love life and how humiliating it was to hear my wife tell her lover how superior he was to me in every way. I knew if I allowed myself to dwell on that right now, I would start to doubt myself, and I couldn't do that just yet. That, I knew would come later, and when it finally hit me, it would likely destroy me. With my list finished, I called Dan's office. 
He was there and told me he'd have everything I needed by noon. He'd even come with me to help me install everything and make sure I knew how to use it. I tried to concentrate on getting some paperwork off my desk when my cell phone rang. I could see it was Sherry, so after three rings I answered it. Her voice never failed to make me feel warm, but this time the warmth was just a precursor to burning anger. Hi baby, how are you feeling? She asked in her most loving voice. Still a little sick to my stomach. I told her. If she only knew how sick. I'm worried about you, honey. You left this morning before I could check on you. Yeah, I have a lot of things I need to take care of and not a lot of time, so I came in early. Please, Jack, take care of yourself. I don't know what I'd do if something happened to you. You know you and the Shelby and Ryan are my whole life. You have a very strange way of showing that, I thought to myself, but what I told her was, yeah, I'll be fine. Just need to get it out of my system. Well, if you're up to it tonight, I can think of a good way to make everything better for you. The witch, I thought, and to think I've been so stupidly blind that I used to swallow her bullshit hook, line and sinker, but not anymore. She was about to get everything that was coming to her. Just bide my time. Sure, we'll see how I feel. Boy, you really must not feel well, to be so disinterested in getting what you know belongs to you, baby. Not disinterested, Sherry, just a lot on my mind right now. See you tonight. I'll be home by six, honey. If you need me for anything, just give me a call. I'm in the office all day today. That's what I needed to hear. I called Dan. He said he had everything ready and I should meet him at the door to the loading dock. We put everything into Dan's van and with the two of us working on the install, had it all in place and tested by 3.30. Then installed the software on my home office PC and set up a secure folder to gather and hold everything the cameras and microphones picked up. We bugged the living room, kitchen, guest bedroom, and of course the master suite, paying special attention to that room with four cameras that would capture virtually everything that went on there. As a final thought, we also installed a camera and mic in the master bath in case the loving couple decided to shower together after their sex romp. Everything was automatically activated by motion with the cameras turning on the mics. I was ready. That night was the toughest one of my life. I couldn't convince myself to play the illness routine again, so after dinner when the kids were asleep I dutifully followed my wife to our room where I turned on my side away from her and pretended to go to sleep. Sherry seemed perturbed since we always cuddled before sleep. She spooned up against my back, draping her arm over me. Anything wrong my love, she asked. No Sherry, I told her, you have always satisfied me. I just wonder sometimes if I'm man enough for you. Jack, why would you say such a thing? You know you have always been enough man for me. My life would end if something happened to you. I'll never need anyone else as long as I have you. You are my perfect lover man. Always have been. Always will be. Yeah, I guess that's just hard to believe sometimes. Jack, what is wrong with you? Nothing Sherry, just tired, and closed my eyes and tried to sleep. Sometime later I heard the sound of Sherry softly crying. I felt no pity for her but I did wonder if she cried out of shame for what she was doing or because she felt like I was being mean to her. Again, I got up before she did and took the opportunity to install the voice recorder under the seat of her car. I also checked out the video and sound from the installed equipment and was assured that everything we'd done the night before was captured cleanly, even in the low-light nighttime conditions in our bedroom. When Sherry got up at first, she was a little snippy, telling me I'd said some things the night before that had hurt her feelings. Then she gave me a peck on the cheek and her mood changed into a cheery one. I guess that's because of her plans for that afternoon with her boss. I poured her a cup of coffee and told her I would be locked in my office all day. She told me she had to spend the entire afternoon showing several homes and was pretty sure she was going to make a big sale, but would be able to pick up Shelby and Ryan after school. With a peck on her cheek, I made my way to the garage door only to have Sherry say, Jack, you forgot to tell me you love me, honey. You know how important it is to me to hear you tell me that every morning before we start our days. Sorry, Sherry. I guess by now I figured you should know how I feel about you. There's just a lot on my mind. Okay, I forgive you this time, but a girl needs to hear her man tell her that he loves her. Don't forget that. I promise, I won't. And I walked out. Yeah, I'll tell some girl how much I love her, if and when I ever find another girl I can trust enough to fall in love with. The information Sherry gave me about showing Holmes all afternoon led me to believe that she would likely be spending some time with the true love of her life. I hope that was the case. I was tired of playing games. I wanted this whole disaster over and done with. I spent the morning actually getting some work done in my office, though I kept glancing at my watch. Finally at noon, I told my secretary that I would be gone for a few hours and set my plan in motion. 
I checked out a company van and parked across the street from my house where I waited to see what transpired. It took till almost one o'clock before I saw Sherry's car pull up to the house, open the garage door and park in her usual spot. When she got out of her car and entered the house without lowering the garage door, I figured she was either going to leave again right away or she was expecting someone. Ten minutes later, I found she was expecting someone as the same car I'd seen the day I caught them together drove up our driveway and into the garage, taking my place just as he had taken my place in my wife's body. I saw him get out of the car and the garage door closed. I had to hand it to them. They had guts to be so blatant about meeting in my house and my bed to carry out their affair. It just proved to me that they both believed there was no way they would ever be caught. Either that or they had both come to the conclusion that they didn't care whether they got caught or not. Well, they would soon find out how wrong they were on both counts. They had been caught and I would make sure that they would both care a great deal. With this final proof of my wife's infidelity and knowing I would soon have all the visual proof I needed of their sordid affair, I finally allowed the tears to fall. For 13 years I had been convinced that my loving wife would never cheat on me just as I would never cheat on her. And with the tears came the first round of doubts. Was he that much better as a lover? I saw that he wasn't any bigger than I was. Maybe he was better looking though neither of us would win any stud awards. Why would she willingly take the chance on destroying our marriage and his marriage too since she had to realize there was no way I would not tell his wife exactly what the two of them were doing? I so desperately wanted to walk into the house and confront them. But why? What would that accomplish? I'd catch them in the act. But hell, I'd already done that once, but they weren't aware of it. Would I feel better by beating the shit out of her lover? Yes, but I'd likely go to jail because of it and frankly by this time neither one of them were worth it. My only worry was how all of this horror would affect my kids and his kids too since I was prepared to destroy him just like he had destroyed me. By 2.30 they must have finished because the garage door opened and her lover backed his car out and left. Fifteen minutes later my wife did the same thing, closing the garage door behind her. I knew she would return home with the kids by 3.30, so I hurriedly parked in the garage and made my way to my home office. I didn't want to take the time to review all the footage the cameras had recorded, just wanted to make sure the evidence I needed was safely on my hard drive. After 10 minutes I'd seen enough. It wasn't a total repeat of the last time they were together, but it was graphic as hell. They'd started out having sex on the kitchen table where I ate my meals. They laughed about how many times they'd wondering if I'd ever figure out that I was eating on the same exact spot where he had sex with her so many times. After that they moved to our bedroom, but not before her a-hole lover suggested doing it in my daughter's room just for a change of scenery. My wife had a fit about that, telling him absolutely not. It was bad enough that she let him rub her husband's face in it, but her kids' rooms would always be out of bounds. At least she seemed to have a few principles, just not where I was concerned. In the bedroom they started again, I noticed neither of them ever said they loved each other, but my wife did continue to tell her boss he was by far the best lover she'd ever had. As a final act, though I couldn't immediately understand why, they moved to the throw rug by the fireplace in the living room where he did her again. Once they were done, I found it odd that she didn't take the time to change the sheets, but figured she would do that when she brought the kids home at 3.30. That left her plenty of time to air the room out and clean the evidence since I seldom got home before 6.00. Knowing the evidence I needed was secure inside my hard drive, I shut the system down and left the house without even bothering to check out the mess I assumed was still present on my marriage bed. I'd seen enough, and even though my heart was hardened against my wife, I still felt sick inside. A sickness that was soon replaced by a burning anger and hatred. I think I actually smiled, knowing the hell I was about to bring down on both of their cheating heads. I returned to work and filled Dan in on everything I'd seen and heard. Like me, he still couldn't understand how a wife as supposedly loving as Sherry could do what it was now perfectly clear she was doing. Not only had she shattered our sacred vows to each other, but she'd gone out of her way to heap as much humiliation as possible on me to her lover, always letting him know he was a better lover, more of a man, the only person who could complete her. All those thoughts sank my soul into a deep abyss of pain and despair I knew I had to climb out of so I could finish my task of destroying both of them. I needed to find a good divorce lawyer and Dan suggested I contact the law firm the company used to see if they could suggest anyone. I talked to one of the corporate lawyers I knew in the firm and he gave me three names of divorce lawyers he knew had successful records in protecting husband's rights. The first one I called was getting ready to retire and wasn't taking new clients, but the second one said he'd make time for me the next afternoon at three. That taken care of I resolved to take care of canceling credit cards, 
changing beneficiaries and moving money around the next morning. When I got home that night, Sherry was in the kitchen fixing dinner while the kids did their homework in their rooms. She was wearing a yellow sundress, and she looked beautiful, and for a minute, I thought my heart would break all over again. She was smiling and seemed so happy. I figured it was her usual post-afternoon delight good mood. Hey baby, how's my man? I hope you had as good a day as I did. She told me actually causing my eyebrows to rise in surprise. My day was interesting. Not that good really, but I did discover several interesting things I wasn't aware of. Why was yours so great? I asked, knowing full well exactly why she was in such a good mood. I'm sure having sex with the world's greatest lover will make your day. I made a sale, she said. First one this week, but I think there might be another one on Thursday when I show some more homes. I guess this must have been your lucky day, I told her with less than great enthusiasm. Anything else special about today? Meet any interesting or special people? I asked. She gave me a strange look. No honey, just the usual. Work to get through my day so I can come home and be with my family. You know that's where my heart is. I nodded my head. I also know where your cunt and ass are, or at least where they were. I thought as I headed up to our bedroom to change clothes. While I changed I noticed that the sheets had been changed and the room aired out. There was still water on the shower floor and I mentioned that to her when I returned to the kitchen. Did you shower sometime this afternoon? She physically jumped at my words and turned to me, a guilty look on her face. No, of course not silly. Why would I do that? I don't know, but there's water on the shower floor and it never stays there more than a few hours. Oh, the drain is probably clogging up again, she said. You may be, but I just cleaned it out a couple of weeks ago. Maybe someone is sneaking into the house to have a tryst with their lover and they shower after they've had a really good session of sex. I said. This time she froze in place for several seconds. She didn't turn to face me, just kept facing the counter with her head down, then continued to pull lettuce apart for a salad. My Jack, you certainly have a vivid imagination, coming up with something like that. Yeah, that's me, I said. Mr. Imagination? Or is it ESP? Sometimes I think I can read people's minds. Well, if you could read my mind, you'd see how much I love you. And she attempted to laugh, but it sounded strained. I'll be in my office. Let me know when dinner is ready. I told her, and she turned slightly and looked at me. She looked worried. Dinner was quiet. Not a lot of conversation. Sherry seemed surprised when I took her usual place at the table and made her sit in my normal spot where she had sex with her boss a few hours before. Jack, you always eat in that place at the table. Why change now? Oh, it's just kind of nice to have a change of scenery for a change. Sherry gave me an odd look, and when she sat down didn't eat much, just more or less pushed food around on her plate. During dinner the kids talked about their day, but Sherry and I just listened for the most part, making appropriate comments from time to time. After we'd all pitched in to help clean the dishes, I returned to my office to work on my project. I ran through footage from that day and picked out suitable still screens that I could turn into photographs, downloaded them to a photo file so that I could make large prints on my Epson T3000. Next, I carefully chose the wording for the signs I would create with the photographs. All that was left to do was see my lawyer to get the divorce started, get my finances in order, and wait till the next time my wife and her lover visited my house. When I finally went to bed that night Sherry was already asleep, or at least pretended to be. I was pretty sure my actions that evening had given her something to think about. Not that it mattered. There was nothing she could do or say that would come close to changing my mind about divorcing her cheating ass. And there was a slight bonus in the fact that I think I'd made her at least a little bit nervous. Today was Tuesday and she'd mentioned that she thought she'd make another sale on Thursday, so I took that to be the signal that she and her lover would be getting together on that day. That would also be the day I destroyed them. The next morning, I again got up early, showered and left before Sherry woke up. I had a lot to accomplish and I wanted to give myself as much time as possible to get it done. My appointment with my lawyer wasn't till 3, so I had ample time to get all the financial things taken care of. My first stop was at HR where I changed the beneficiary on my life insurance and 401k from Sherry to Shelby and Ryan. I got some strange looks from the woman who helped me, but I didn't feel like I owed her or anyone else an explanation for my actions. My next step was to cancel all our joint credit cards and get another made out in my name only. Then it was time to head to the bank where I transferred half of the money in our joint checking and savings accounts to another bank in my name. I knew I should do something about our home, but I was pretty sure the courts would let Sherry stay there with the kids, so I postponed any action on that front till I'd had a chance to consult with my lawyer. 
At three, I met with my lawyer and found him to be a likable enough guy. He warned me that since we were in a no-fault state, I could expect her to get custody of Shelby and Ryan, and I'd lose the house and half of everything else to my wife even if I had proof of her infidelity. I told him how I wanted him to write up the petition, and when he told me I'd never get away with taking almost everything from her, I told him not to worry. I was pretty sure I could convince her to go along with whatever I wanted. He wasn't happy, but he bowed to my demands, telling me he would have everything ready to have her served Friday morning. I also had him prepare papers to file against her boss and the company he was part owner in for purposefully destroying my marriage. Those papers were also going to be ready by Friday morning. I was set. When I got home that night, I was cool towards Sherry. Frankly, I'd had it and just wanted the whole thing over with so I could get on with my life. I knew there was a ton of pain and sorrow still to come, but I understood there was no turning back and anyway, I'd finally be sharing the pain and suffering with my slut of a wife and her asshole lover. After a quiet dinner with little conversation, I retreated to my man cave, printed the photos of the lovers I was going to use and created the signs, accomplishing everything without interruption. I also had time to write a letter to Greg Allen's wife, enclosing four by five prints of the big photos I was using on the posters and telling her I had plenty of video to supply her with in case she decided to divorce her husband like I was dumping my wife. Shortly after 11, I went to our bedroom to make sure Sherry was asleep, then made my way to her car retrieved the voice-activated recorder from under her seat, rewound and listened to what was on it. I was only getting one side of the conversations and there appeared to be several actual business calls, but there was one that appeared to be to Greg. I love her. Thanks again for this afternoon. Me too. I always miss you after we're together. Yes. Oh my God, would a whole week together be heaven? Yes. Maybe we can before long. We can make up a real estate convention that we absolutely must attend. You'll give me enough to drive me crazy. Yes, baby. Only you. You know if I didn't have to give Jack some sex every once in a while to keep him happy, I would be your exclusive property. Yes, baby. We're on for Thursday afternoon. I can't wait either. Bye, baby. I was surprised to find that what she said didn't hurt as bad as it had before. Maybe there was hope for me yet. Little did she know how soon she would be his exclusive property forever, and of course the fact that I was one day away from destroying their sweet lives gave me a warm feeling. Revenge I was discovering was powerful medicine. I replaced the tape with a new one and placed the recorder back under her seat where I hoped it would record evidence of her torture the next day when her world fell apart. I barely slept at all that night, not because I was heartbroken, I'd gone beyond that. No, I had trouble sleeping, anticipating everything I hoped would happen the next day. For the final time, I got out of bed while Sherry continued to sleep. I stood looking down at the woman who had been the love of my life, the mother of my children, the woman I expected to spend the rest of my life with. I felt tears coming into my eyes as I realized I had slept with her for the final time. Never again would I make love to her. Never again would we cuddle or talk about our future. We had no future, and as I turned and walked away from her, I wondered if she had any idea the price she was about to pay for turning against me. She probably didn't, but she'd soon find out. I showered and left the house, stopped for breakfast at a diner, then made a brief stop at work to let my secretary know I'd be out for the day. I called Dan and let him know what was about to go down. He wished me luck, told me to be careful and to let him know how everything went. I made a quick stop at my lawyer's to make sure everything was ready to have my wife and Greg Allen serve the next day. After that, I called my wife to tell her I would pick up the kids from school. My mom said since they had no school on Friday, she wanted them for the long weekend so I'd stop by the house around 3.45 to pick up some clothes and take them directly over to mom's. She thought that was wonderful and using her sexiest voice told me it would give us time on Saturday to spend the day in bed. Sure, I told her and hung up. I had gotten to the point where I just couldn't stand to listen to her bullshit. I took my time getting back to my house. By 12.30, I was parked around the corner waiting for the action to begin. My car was mostly hidden from sight, but I could just see any car that pulled into my driveway. I didn't need to see the garage door go up and down. My wife and her lover were predictable if nothing else, and I was aware of their routine. At 12.50, I saw Sherry's car turn into the driveway, followed five minutes later by Greg Allen's. The bait was taken, and I was ready to reel them in. I should have felt pain knowing that my wife and her boss were having sex with each in my marriage bed while I sat around the corner waiting for them to finish, but she lost her ability to hurt me. I couldn't believe how calm I was as I pictured in my mind all the things I knew they were doing together. It was almost like remembering a cheap porn flick. One with very little plot, but one bang-up ending. 
At 10 till 3 I saw shithead Alan's car back out of the driveway and leave. 10 minutes later Sherry followed sweet. I noticed as she drove away that she was applying new lipstick. As soon as they were gone I drove into my garage and closed the door. I had work to do and not a lot of time to get it done. I went to my office and checked the tape from that afternoon session. It was all there. The insults were there too about how much better he was at sex than I would ever be. There was a difference this time though. This time I didn't care. After I made sure the footage was safely downloaded into my hard drive, I spent the next 10 minutes taking all of my handmade signs with their photographs up the stairs, placing them by the front door where they would be handy. Next, I packed a toothbrush and some clothes for Shelby and Ryan and put them in my car. The only regret I had about what I was about to do was how much pain I was about to cause the two children I loved more than anything in the world. I took comfort in the fact that I had not caused the pain they would soon feel when they realized their mom and dad were no longer together. No, that responsibility lay firmly on their mother's head. She was the one that chose to have a lengthy affair and completely destroy her family. At 3.15, I drove to their school and was there to pick them up when the final bell rang. I told them they would be spending the weekend with grandma, and since she always spoiled them rotten, they were thrilled. 45 minutes later, I had dropped them off and returned to the house where I put my plan into action. And that brings us back to where we started. Bed, table and rug on the lawn with all the signs, the neighbors watching and Sherry coming home to the horror of learning the truth, that I knew everything. I did not hear from Sherry that night, though I thought I would. There was a call late that evening from her cell phone, but when I answered there was no one there. I was visited by the police an hour after Sherry left. They were sympathetic but told me I had to remove the signs and photographs or they would have to cite me for disturbing the peace and public indecency. I took them down. They had done what I wanted them to do. They were seen by my wife and I knew from the look on her face before I turned away from her that her life had begun to spiral down into hell. That night I drank the better part of a fifth of Maker's Mark and passed out in an alcoholic stupor. I woke up Friday morning with a world-class hangover, but in spite of that I still felt a sense of power. Yes, I was sad and lonely, but I knew I'd had the strength to bury my anger and hatred long enough to exact my revenge against my faithless wife and her lover. Around noon, I opened the front window curtains and saw that the rug, kitchen table, and bed were gone. The only things left were the mattress and sex-stained sheets. I'd haul those away, or burn them later, I thought. The rest of the morning was uneventful, but by three in the afternoon, all hell began to break out. I was sure that Greg Adams' wife would have received the letter and photographs that morning and my lawyer had called me to let me know both Sherry and Greg Adams and his partners had been served at work. He said he was there when they were served and Sherry screamed and fell to the floor sobbing, while Greg Adams totally ignored her as he stomped around the office calling me in names, threatening to kill me. His partners, however, locked themselves behind closed doors for 15 minutes before returning to hand Sherry her final check and telling her that her services were no longer required. They also handed Greg a check for his share of the partnership. When he told them he had no intention of selling to them, they quoted to him the section of their corporate bylaws concerning morality and sexual fraternization with staff members. The section plainly gave them the mandate and right to sever all relationships with him and his mistress. At the same time, the front desk receptionist told him that his wife was on the phone demanding to speak with him. She had gotten the letter and photos I'd sent, and she wanted to tell him not to bother to come home and to let him know that she would be filing for divorce the next day. I later learned from the husband of one of the women that worked at the agency that after Adams was escorted from the building, everyone turned their backs on my soon-to-be ex-wife and she lay on the floor for a good 30 minutes sobbing and moaning. At some point, she apparently pulled herself together enough to leave the building but no one was sure where she had gone. The next day, I finally got a call from Sherry. She sounded horrible. She wanted to know where the children were and if they knew. I told her they were safe at my mother's place, that they did not know and wouldn't hear any of the sordid details from me. She thanked me for that and then asked if she could come by and pick up some of her things and I of course told her she could. All she had to do was tell me when and I would leave for a few hours while she got what she needed. She wanted to know if I could stay and talk to her, and I told her I really had nothing to say to her, causing her to start sobbing again. You know I'm sorry, she said. You have to know how sorry I am, Jack, and that I never meant to hurt you. I couldn't help myself. I actually started laughing. How in hell could you tell me you were sorry, Sherry, and you never wanted to hurt me? What did you think I'd do when I found out? Congratulate the two of you. I never wanted you to find out. I love you, Jack. I've never loved anyone but you. I don't think you really believe that, Sherry. How could you? 
After telling your lover how much better he made you feel than I ever could. How he was the only man who could complete you. How every time I made love to you all you could think about is wanting to have him inside you. Jack, I never said those things. How could you think I would ever say those things to him? Because I have the recordings of you saying those things to him, Sherry, every word. Telling him that if you didn't have to let me have sex with you every once in a while, to keep me happy. I have it all, Sherry, every word, every shame you tried to place on my head to him, every degrading thing you could ever say about any man you said to your lover about me, your husband. I don't have anything to say to you, Sherry, and there is nothing you can say to me that would make even the smallest difference in how I feel about you. I love you, Jack. You have to believe that I've always loved you, only you. I don't know what made me say those things to Greg. You have to believe that I didn't mean any of it. I was just trying to build up his ego because he always told me how his wife was always putting him down. So let me get this straight. You constantly tore me down to him, belittling me and my pathetic efforts at love making so you could stroke his ego and build him up because you felt sorry for him. Is that your story? You felt bad that his wife put him down so you not only put me down, but you had sex with him in every way possible for the last six months just to make him feel better about himself. Yes, Jack. I never meant to hurt you. I didn't mean any of it. If you didn't mean any of it, then why did you do it? I don't know, Jack. It just seemed dirty, and I felt like I should be dirty with Greg. That's all it was with Greg. Fun and dirty sex. I had to keep it separate from what I had with you, which had to always be loving and clean. You really are one very sick puppy, Sherry. I'm amazed it took me so long to see it. Shame on me for being so blindly stupid. I don't love him, Jack. I love you. Please, Jack. If you can find it in your heart to give me a chance to make it right, I'll give you everything. I was so stupid. I only belong to you. Only you, Jack. You have to believe that. I made a mistake, but that can't be the end of us. Let me show you. I can come to you right now. Please, Jack. Please. Don't leave me. Sorry, Sherry. I don't love you. And I don't have to leave you. You left me. The things you did with him, and the degrading, humiliating things you said about me, over and over and over again for over six months proved you don't love me. You can't love someone and wish him that kind of pain and harm and humiliation. I think you're disgusting Sherry, an evil and disgusting woman, and I cannot wait to have you out of my life. Do you really think I want anything to do with your ass after you gave it to him and promised it only to him forever? I wouldn't touch your skanky body if you were the last woman on earth. The only reason that I will ever have anything to do with you at all is the children. Remember them, Shelby and Brian, the kids we created when we were still a family? You shit on them too. I want to spare them as much pain as possible, but I don't want to spare you anything. In fact, I want you to feel all of the pain you've heaped on me. You and your lover Greg both deserve it, and I want you to feel it. Why did you tell his wife, Jack? That was unfair. Unfair? Are you completely delusional, Sherry? What you did to me and our children is unfair. Why the hell do you think I told her? Number one, he destroyed my family by having sex with my wife over and over again. Number two, he took possession of the one body on this earth I thought was mine to have and hold, and he made her tell him how wonderful he was and what a miserable failure I was. And number three, his wife needed to know what an absolute miserable failure of a human being she is married to. What she does with that information is up to her. They have children, Jack. So do I, Sherry, and my two are the ones I want to protect. I feel bad for his kids too, but it's not because of me that they may be facing the possibility of a future without their dad. It's his fault, and your fault too, Sherry. I refuse to take any of the blame here. I don't want a divorce, Jack. I'll fight for our marriage. There's nothing to fight for. I would honestly rather be dead than have to be shackled to you for the rest of my life. I know you still love me, Jack. You have too. You can't just turn that off over one thing like this. My God, you are delusional, completely out of your mind. Did you read the divorce petition you were served with? No, why should I? If you'll just listen to reason and let me make it up to you, there won't be any divorce. If you can't do it for me, at least do it for Shelby and Ryan. They need a mother and a father, Jack. They will always have a mother and a father. We just won't be married or living together in the same house. If you had bothered to read the petition, you would see that as long as you agree to joint custody for our children, you can stay in the house and have half of all our worldly goods. What isn't in the petition? But what I'm telling you now is that if you don't sign the petition and agree to the more than favorable terms, I'm offering you I will share the videos of you and your dumb shit lover with every person you've ever known, including your parents and your sister and her children and any other person I can think of. You wouldn't do that, Jack. You can't hate me that much. Oh, there's where you're wrong, Sherry. I can and I will, and there is nothing on earth that will stop me. Fight me and I will ruin your life forever.
And yes, Sherry, I can hate you that much. Please, Jack, don't do this. Sign the divorce papers, Sherry. Please, Jack, let me make this up to you. No can do. Sign the papers, Sherry. Oh God, please. Sign the papers, Sherry. And I hung up on her. Sherry signed the papers and the divorce was final in six months. She lives with Shelby and Ryan in the home we used to share and I live in a condo a few blocks away. We are in the same school district, so there was little interruption in the kids' schedule though the pain of the divorce was felt by both of them. Shelby told me that their mother admitted she had made a bad mistake and our marriage couldn't get around it, but we both assured the kids that we would always be there for them. I have no idea what Sherry told her parents and sister about the breakup, but since they all still speak to me, I guess she didn't tell them I was to blame. As far as my mother is concerned, it was just something that neither Sherry nor I could get past. I did get a final chance to retrieve the audio recorder from Sherry's car, and the voice track was memorable. She'd called Greg on her way home, and again thanked him for a wonderful afternoon, but she told him she thought I might be getting suspicious and suggested they cool things for a couple of weeks, just till she knew the coast was clear. Then when she pulled up to the house, she got confused, wondering what all the people were doing standing in the street, looking at our yard. Then when she saw the signs and photographs and realized what I'd done, her screams almost broke the recorder. As she drove away, she was sobbing and saying, What did you do, Jack? What did you do? And then I believe reality hit her like a bucket of ice water and her story changed to, Oh God, what did I do? No God, please. What did I do? Please God, make it all go away. She managed to call her lover, and when he answered, she screamed, He knows Greg. About us. Jack knows everything. And then, just sobs for a very long time. It's over a year now since the fires of hell washed over all of us and gradually, I am starting to put the pieces together again. I still do not date and likely won't for a while yet. The thought of a repeat of what I just went through has me still very leery of getting into another serious relationship. Shelby told me that her mom had gone out on a date one time, but came home crying and as far as she knew had not dated again. Sherry found a job as a receptionist in a retirement village and has given up real estate, at least for the moment. I've never learned if she stays in touch with Greg Allen and I don't care. Greg Allen and his wife are divorced and he has been unable to find a job. You see, even though I did not send the video of their sex sessions to anyone Sherry knew, I was not as kind to Greg. It seems that a lot of businesses are spooked by the possibility of hiring someone who has the reputation of seducing married women and breaking up their marriages. Of course, I fuzzed out Sherry's face in the videos, but I did leave all of the audio intact. I recently heard that Greg's former wife is dating a nice guy, a policeman, and it seems to be getting serious. Good for her. Oh, and speaking of Greg's former company, to avoid any bad publicity, they made a generous offer to me to keep from suing them. I accepted and as far as I'm concerned, it's all behind me. For now, I'm just interested in my children and their future. Maybe one day my future will become important to me too. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like share and subscribe.